Hello, my name is Andre and I'm your instructor for today. And today we're gonna to talk about SharePoint and how it relates to OneDrive and Teams. And I'm just gonna share with you my perspective and hopefully you'll get a lot of value out of this video. If you like this video, please take a second and subscribe to my brand new channel. This is my first video right out of the gate. So please subscribe and click the bell. And here we go. Now, first things first, I've got to start out of the gate with something that's a little unconventional because we are talking about SharePoint here. But before we do that, I have to actually tell you that you, you have lived through a revolution. Now, you might be thinking, Prince and the Revolution, and yes, some of us have lived through Prince and the Revolution, but I'm actually talking about the kind of revolution that we learned about in history. I'm talking about the kind of revolution where countries change, whole cultures, whole countries change because they've had a revolution. Now in our country, the probably the most uh, well-taught um, revolution that our country have has experienced is the industrial revolution all right and so I actually want to remind you a little bit of what we got taught from the industrial revolution so that I can then show you that yes we here today have lived through a revolution so let me remind you about the industrial revolution it started around 1890 is when it started now before around 1890 what was our culture like well at that time you had a family and a family would own land and they would farm the land or they had a trade and they would produce their trade and they would bring it into the communities and they would share trades and that's kind of how the communities uh, took care of each other it was kind of like commerce they would you know one person is you had the bakers who were baking the food you had the the farmers who were growing the food you had the smiths who were making the, the silverware like that's kind of how the communities were now if you zero in on like one family in particular you probably had a mom and a dad who were the farmers let's say for example and the father would get up in the morning and they would go out into the field and they would take the son with them and they would go out and they would basically uh, perform their trade and they would teach their trade to the son and then at the same time the son is being parented and all that good stuff right um, meanwhile the woman would be in the home and unlike what we like to call it today we like to call it housewives right but it's actually her running the business the administrative side of the business from inside of the home and she is also passing on that information to the daughter as well as parenting the daughter and as a family the whole family would run their business and then pass the business on to their children and there was a legacy left for their children however it was a risky business back then because back then if your business failed it wasn't like oh no i'm bankrupt let me file for bankrupt and we'll just try again and do a new startup it wasn't like that back then sometimes their businesses would fail and they would starve to death or their business would fail and you know it would be very bad for them right so i want you to picture that that's what life was like um, getting around meant that you had a good horse and of course the community depended on you to do your trade in order to keep the community alive well then we had the introduction of these individuals right here now these individuals hit the scene and you will recognize who they are and what their contribution was because these names you know even all the way to today and these are the individuals that basically started the industrial revolution now what exactly did they do they brought a new technology into the scene and the technology that they brought was the assembly line and the assembly line the way they administered that technology was through a factory so they went out and they convinced all the men in all of their trades that hey we promise you that if you have a bad year when your uh, uh, trade or when your company goes under we promise you that we'll take care of you we'll make sure you stay paid and everything as long as you just come and work in our factory on the assembly line so these guys convinced all the men of the time to come and leave their home trade leave their family trade and come in and work in the factory well since the kids the boys couldn't follow the fathers into the factories the boys all end up going to 
boarding school, all right? Well, nobody realized, but very soon after, um, our country went to war, all right? And when our country went to war, all the men had to leave the factory to go to war, and then the women left the home business and came to work in the factory, and now the women are separated from the daughters, and now the daughters are now in school with the boys, and, and school becomes co-ed. And that was kind of the onset of the, the tip, typical work day of going to work, and also the typical school day of getting up and going to school. Um, what was lost was kind of like the whole family business, family legacy was then kind of lost. But that time is also where we get the Rosie the Riveter uh, imagery that we have in our culture, showing that the women could step in and do all of the jobs that the men were doing, right? So it wasn't a bad thing necessarily to have this whole change in the way that we were working with the onset of work in school. A lot of amazing things came out of the Industrial Revolution. Like, I mean, all the technology, the telephone, TV, like all the cool things that came out of that technology with the assembly line and factor, uh, factories and manufacturing and all that stuff. All that stuff was amazing, right? And that all was based on the things that these men brought to the table. And so, um, so why do I bring that up? Because if you picture you living through that revolution, you probably had a horse at the time, and that was your primary transportation. And you probably um, tried to hold on to your horse as long as you can, but soon around you, you started to see Model T cars driving around and passing you up. And you might've thought to yourself, there is no way you're getting me into that vehicle with the smoke fuming out of the back and it's so loud and making noise like, I'm gonna stick to my horse, Betsy. But after a while, you start to get to your factory job with Betsy, and now there's a sign up that says, no horse is allowed in the parking lot. So you try to take Betsy back home, and you get on the freeway, and then you get pulled over by the police, and they're like, sorry, you can't have your horse on the freeway, and now you get a ticket for riding your horse on the freeway. And you realize that the world is changing, all right? And so to comfort yourself, you say, Betsy, let's go buy some shoes, right? So you take Betsy over to the shoe uh, company that was number one in horseshoes for so many years, but you get there and now they're under new management and now the company is selling tires and you can't even buy a good pair of shoes for Betsy anymore, right? That is because there was a revolution and everything changed, all right? Now, I want you to just picture living in that time and, and imagine how easily it would have been for somebody to give up their horse. Not easy at all. They would have hold, held on to that as long as they can. Well, I'm now suggesting that you have gone through the exact same scenario in your life today. And the, the individuals that brought about this revolution, you probably recognize their names as well. And these individuals brought the technology called GPS and they administered the GPS through the smartphone. So in the old, the industrial revolution brought the assembly line, that was the technology. In the new world, the technology was GPS and it was administered through the smartphone. And that brings us to the information age, all right? So you probably were born are, were, was definitely very heavily influenced by everything that we had learned in the Industrial Revolution, but now the Industrial Rev Revolution is over, probably as about, of about maybe 1996 to 2001. That is the area where we switched, and now we live in the information age, okay? So let's do some comparison. Let's talk about what that means, that we now live in the information age, right? Well, first of all, in the old world, you know, you were probably, you probably remember the, the days when computers first started to show up, right? And when you got your first computer, uh, chances are everything on your computer was mimicking everything that we had learned from the Industrial Revolution. So in other words, in the Industrial Revolution where things were mechanical, when we had content in our head that we wanted to share with people, we would write it down on pieces of paper and then we would file that paper away and that's how we were keeping track of all of our content. Well, when the computers happened, they mimicked that. So at work you had a desk, so when your computer came you had a desktop. Um, you had a documents, 
paper documents where you put your content. So when the computer came along, we had Word that would create documents for us. And we would put our paper documents into manila folders and file it in the file cabinet. So when the computers came, we had folder structure and we had file, you know, file manager and all of that, which everything mimicked everything that we learned in the industrial revolution. However, we are now far enough away from the industrial revolution into this new revolution that now we're starting to experience things that have never existed before. We're starting to have technologies and ways of doing things that are not based on what we previously knew before. For example, there is no um, technology before that would let us uh, send a message to a president and then have the president respond immediately. There was no technology before that would allow us to see flooding that's happening on another continent on the same day that it's happening. Like um, to be able to sit on your couch and pull up your device and order food and have it uh, arrive at your house within 30 minutes. Like these things uh, never were possible before. So that's the first comparison. We're not basing anything that we're doing in this day and age on the Industrial Revolution any longer. We're not basing our technology on that. Now, let's start to drill into kind of you at work, right? So when you're at work, you would probably organize your data in a static uh, um, method. So what I mean by that is our model in the Industrial Revolution was the library. And the library was a static way to organize. You would uh, put the book in one location and that's where the book is. And in order to find the book, you had to go to that location to find it. So it was a static way of organizing. And we did that too. When we first started working on our computers in the file structure, we created these static locations to put our content. Basically folders inside of folders inside of folders, right? But here's the problem with that. And you'll, you'll um, relate to this issue. Some people would organize, let's say that you had a document that was a form that had to be filled out during onboarding. And let's say that it was a tax form, right? So you would go to file this tax form into your file structure. And some of you would say, well, we need to put this in the onboarding folder because that's when they're gonna fill it out. Others of you would say, well, no, we need to put this in the tax folder because it's a tax related document. And then others people would say, no, we have to put this in the forms folder because it's a form to be filled out. So I just want you to know whoever was in charge of organizing this document and organize your file structure, they made a choice. And there's like two thirds of the people that would have done it differently. So because of that fact, most things that you are filing have multiple criteria, but the way that you had to file it in a static data situation is you had to choose one of those criteria and that's where you had to put it. Now that caused problems because other people can't find things the way that certain people organize, right? And so even to this day, many of us struggle with trying to find where did we put that content because we are organizing by putting the content in a location and then we have to manage all of the hundreds of thousands of locations that we've created all right so i want you to know that that's what we got taught in the old world and there was a time where that was the most recent technology and that was the latest technology but not anymore in the new world we are actually organizing in a dynamic fashion. So I always say, imagine you go to Hogwarts and you get some magic glasses. Instead of you putting all of your content in files and folders so that you can find it, imagine just having all your content in one giant pile. And the only thing you had to do was just say, I need to see the forms. So you put on the form glasses and bingo, now you see all of the forms in front of you. Or you put the glasses on, you say, I need to see the tax documents. And now all the tax documents are in front of you. No matter what your criteria is, you could put the, the glasses on and you will see what you're looking for. And that is the way the new world works, right? The new world works. Now, uh, um, now connected to that, is the fact that in the old world, in order for you to accomplish the static data organization, you were relying on folders. And folders inside of folders inside of folders is how you were creating all these locations to put your info. Well, this part, I hope you're sitting down for this, but in the new world, folders are no longer the technology because now in this world, the way that we're uh, organizing is not by putting our content 
in different locations. Now we're organizing with what's called dynamic views. Now, this is not new to you because when you're on Netflix and you're looking for Frozen, because I know that's what you guys are looking for. When you're looking for Frozen on Netflix, right? Are you going into a folder, inside of a folder, inside of a folder to get to Frozen? Like when you're on Netflix, are you using folders at all for anything, right? Not really, right? You're not using folders at all. What are you doing in Netflix? In Netflix, you're saying, show me animation. And then you're looking at animation and then you see Frozen, right? Are you saying, show me children? And you click on children and then you see all of the children movies and then you see Frozen. Or some of you are like, show me like frequently you frequently watched, right? How many times are you watching Frozen? Okay, you're watching it probably too many times. So you can click on frequently watched and it will bring up Frozen, right? And at no time are you using folders in order to find that movie. That's a dynamic view. What Netflix has is showing you these different ways to look at it. However, you are not actually going to a location to find that info, okay? So um, that's what I mean by a dynamic view. Netflix is your example of that, okay? Now, um, with that said, realize that in the old world, because you're putting everything a folder inside of a folder inside of a folder, we had to manage those locations by knowing the path that we had to take to find that information. So we had to manage the file paths. And you guys remember this, right? Remember that it was required at work that you had to put the file path in the footer of your document so that everybody could understand where the document was saved. And, uh, and, and people would um, have to manage all these file paths, right? Well, I want you to know in the new world, we are not using file paths any, paths any longer that tell us where the content is. In the new world, we're now using URLs. And you know what's so cool about the URL is you don't have to know where it is um, when you use a URL. As long as you have the URL, you can click it and it will give you the document. So imagine instead of going to the library and then going in and using the Dewey Decimal System to find out where your book is, and then going all the way up the stairs to the third floor and going to the right row and the right column and the right shelf to get the book, only to find out the book's already checked out. It's not even where it's supposed to be because somebody else took it. We're not operating like that any longer. Now, in the new world with the URL, we go to the library and they open the front door and hand us the book because we have the URL. We don't have to go in. We don't have to find out where the book is. As long as we have the URL, it is being handed to us. All right. So with that said, in the new world, we don't care where something is any longer because we're no longer managing the where. Now, let's keep going. I'm going to give you some more examples. Who are, where are all of my Excel people? All the people that love Excel, right? Now, Excel is very powerful when it comes to uh, analyzing data, but we also use Excel for this other purpose where we're putting information in that we need to go back and look up later. So I'm calling that reference data. Like when you have your phone list in Excel, that phone list is you having reference data that you're gonna go in and you're gonna look up somebody's phone number, okay? So think about that, like logs, the logs you have, the, the reference information where you're going to look up information, that's what I'm calling reference data. And in the old world, Excel was where we put that because Excel already came with rows and columns, which was great for us, right? However, in the new world, um, we are now getting our rows and columns directly in the program called SharePoint, a SharePoint list. So whenever we need to reference information, we could go straight to SharePoint and we don't actually need to use Excel for our reference data any longer. And it's kind of like using a Ferrari to drive to the mailbox anyway. Excel is so huge and so powerful and all we have is a phone, a phone list with 30 people on there. It's overkill to use Excel to store reference data. So we're gonna now start putting all of our reference data in SharePoint in a SharePoint list instead. And that is gonna remove about 60 to 80% of our need of Excel on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, right? Now, let's talk about Word. In Word, we're organizing all of our flowing text, and I'm gonna say we're organi organizing that in a linear fashion. In other words, our text starts at the beginning and it's a straight line until we get to the end, right? Like, uh, so if you needed the information that was on page 36, you had to deal with 35 pages that came before that, right? 
So that's what I mean that our data is stored in a linear fashion, all right? Well, there are other ways to organize. For example, linear organizes in a straight line, okay? Like one after the other consecutive, okay? There's also um, hierarchical, or you can say pyramidal, where it's like your company's org chart, where it starts at the top and then it makes a pyramid all the way down. So that's the second way that you can organize. Web pages are organized that way. By the way, all distrib distribution is organized that way, like you create it at the factory and then it just distributes out to all of the, that's a, a pyramidal um, organizational uh, method, right? Web pages are set up that way. Um, there's also matrix, which is columns and rows, like what we have with Excel or when you're using it, um, uh, to show information, you're kind of using the tic-tac-toe framework. That's like organizing in what's called a matrix where it's columns and rows. And then the fourth way to organize is called radial. And radial is when you start with a hub on the, on the center and it radiates out with spokes. And when you, it radiates out, it connects to other hubs and all the hubs start interconnecting with each other and it creates a network. So that network becomes the World Wide Web, okay? The World Wide Web is an example of radial organization. Um, you also have uh, your uh, nervous system in your body is also radial, okay? And in the new world, radial is how we're now organizing our data. So when you think of Wikipedia, Wikipedia is the new way we organize our data. Now, how does that work, right? So you go to Wikipedia and, you know, if you're, if you're like me, you're like, in vogue you're doing a search for in vogue right and it's going to come up and it's going to be like in vogue famous girl group from the 90s with uh their hits you know hold on and my loving no you're never going to get it okay and then it says founding members of in vogue uh is don robinson cindy Heron braggs um um maxine jones and terry ellis and then i'm like ooh, terry ellis she was my favorite let me click on her and i could say click and I don't have to finish reading everything about Invoke. I could just click Terry Ellis's name and it takes me right to Terry Ellis's book, right? Oops, let me get in there. Book, right? It's going to take me right to Terry Ellis's book. So now I'm reading a completely different write-up and it says Terry Ellis um, got her fame as a founding member of Invoke, but can be seen around town with her best friend, Holly Robinson Pete. And I'm like, Holly Robinson Pete, who is that? Oh, I, I recognize that name. And then I'm like, click let's see who holly robinson pete is holly robinson pete first hit the scene alongside johnny depp in 21 jump street and you're like oh yeah i remember that show 21 jump street and you're like what's johnny depp's doing click and now you're on Johnny Depp. okay so that's the new world and by the way we call that down the rabbit hole right you just went down the rabbit hole um looking for a content okay so but that is the new way we're dealing with text flow we're no longer just putting it in one line and creating books instead we're creating online content that is clickable that jumps you from one piece of content to the other using the urls and the links no longer reading page by page by page okay so that's that comparison let's talk about security all right security in the old world secure security was always in the hardware so for example when you think of your home when you think of your house what makes your house secure it's the front door and the front door has a lock on it so in the old world all of the security was either a lock that you had externally or a lock on a door or a lock on a window like all of the security is always by you surrounding yourself with some kind of hardware that keeps you safe putting yourself in a cage is pretty secure right or jail i guess that's jail so anyway <laughs> Um, that is security. That's the old world. All right. Um, but in the new world, we're not putting the security any longer in the hardware where I can kick your door down or I could copy the key or steal the key and come into your home. Uh, we're not, we're not putting the security in the hardware any longer. Now the security is in you. You have to be who you are and you have to authenticate yourself in order to get in. So, I, you know, you guys probably remember, you know, True Blood. Did you guys watch True Blood? I know you were probably watching Vampire Diaries. Okay, you remember? But you guys remember vampires can't come in unless they're invited, right? That's the new world security. In the new world, you can't come in the house 
unless you are who you're supposed to be. So that means you could all take your front doors off of your house now because in the new world, you don't need a door with a key. Nobody's going to come in unless they're invited, right? You guys trust that? Are you trusting in that right now? <laughs> that makes you guys nervous, right? When you think about your house with no door. But in the new world, that's how security is. Now, the first way that we have learned to authenticate ourselves was definitely like we had to have the password and the password was in our head. So if we knew the password that authenticated that it was us. But of course, we know that that wasn't a foolproof method, but it's getting better and better because now that they're starting to do facial recognition, you're doing your thumbprint on your phone. So there are all of these ways that are coming about pretty soon. It'll be retinal scan, right? Okay. So um, these are all ways that we are authenticating ourselves. And that's what the new world security looks like. All right. So it's no longer lock and key. It's now you have to be who you are. All right. Now, with that said, realize that the old security would always administer either full access that you got in because you had the key or no access, you're completely locked out. But in the new world, it's not an either or situation. Um, in the new world, it's you have custom permissions. So in the new world, I can say you have permission to come into my house, but you do not have permission to open my refrigerator and eat all the food out of it, right? Because I'm setting custom permissions. You can come in, but you can't go upstairs, all right? Whereas in the old world, if I gave you the key to my house, you would have access to the refrigerator. You can go upstairs, downstairs, go in every room because you have full access or you're completely locked out and you have no access. So these comparisons, I'm giving you these comparisons so that you can kind of recognize that you are completely in a new world. You've lived through a revolution. Now, why do I take the time to explain all of this to you in a SharePoint class? It's because SharePoint is not based on anything from the old world. All right. SharePoint is completely new and SharePoint is created in the digital age. It is not something that is based on something that you've seen before. Now, one of the things that I hear all the time when I'm teaching my SharePoint classes is SharePoint is a file repository, right? That is not actually what SharePoint is. SharePoint is not an update to your files, uh, your file browser, your file explorer, right? SharePoint is not an update for your file explorer. What is SharePoint? SharePoint is web pages. Okay. That is all it is. SharePoint is nothing but web pages. Um, SharePoint is just a giant website. All right. And it's nothing more, nothing less. So for example, you all know what web pages are like you're all on the internet like you all have a facebook page right and you go to amazon and you shop online and you go on to you've got pinterest and you have all these websites that you like that you go for think about it for a second do you have any questions about how to go online do you have any questions about how to do anything on the internet no you guys are all you're all professionals at being on the internet you all know how web pages work all right, because we've been on the internet for years and years now, right? So what is the problem with SharePoint? How come people are struggling with SharePoint when everybody knows how to go to the internet, right? The reason I believe is this, and this is my humble opinion, but here's what I think is the issue based on all the classes that I've been teaching on, on this topic. Here's what I'm concluding. Do you remember how? before the revolution when the computers were all coming out and we first got exposed to the internet for the first time right when we first got exposed to the internet um do you remember being at work and do you remember being like forbidden to go to the internet like we were not allowed to go to the internet at all when we were at work you guys remember that so <laughs> I, I believe that we have been so ingrained and so taught that we cannot be on the internet while we're at work, that when we go to work, our brain completely shifts back to the old world, right? So we're at home, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on our phone, and that's the new world. And then we get in the car and we drive to work and our brain shifts back to the old world where we're not allowed to think like the internet. All right. So what do we have when we get to work? Well, what we have at work is a hardware network. This was the model that we used before 
the revolution in the industrial age, we would mechanically connect every computer together um, using a giant computer in the middle that's called a server, right? And everybody would be connected to the server. Do you guys remember those days at work where you, you're home sitting on the couch and you're oh no, I forgot to send that email. So you had to go get in the car, you had to go drive in, you had to log in to the building after hours and go sit at your desk, fire up your work computer, and then send the email because your work computer was connected to this hardware network and that was the only way for you to send that email out, right? And that's because the internet was completely shielded from your work environment by this firewall. And everything you did at work was old school technology, old school mechanical, everything physically connected with physical wires at a physical location. And that's why we had to be at work to do our job. We couldn't do our job remote. We couldn't do our job at home or anything like that, right? Until now, because now, your job has just been given SharePoint. And what is SharePoint? Web pages, which means your company, your um, department, your area of work now has its own private internet. You have your own private internet and now everything that you've ever known about what to do when you're on the internet in the public world on the World Wide Web, you now have those same capabilities that you can now do privately for yourself at work. So if you're on the internet and you like YouTube, you can come to work and you can create a YouTube and SharePoint. If you like uh, uh, shopping online and you like to be able to purchase and see the products and then purchase them, you can come to your company and you can create an online market and shop online at your work, right? Everything you've ever seen on the internet can be done in SharePoint because SharePoint is your company's private internet. Now, when you're at home and you're on the internet and you need to find something, you go to Google, right? And Google is your search engine. Can Google see your SharePoint site? Nope. Google can't see your SharePoint site because your SharePoint site is private. All right. So when you're on your SharePoint site, can you do a search, a Google search on your SharePoint site? You can, but you won't be using Google to do that, right? You're going to be using Microsoft Bing because Microsoft is um, uh, the, the reason that you have your own private internet is because Microsoft created one for you. All right. So you use a Microsoft search engine, Microsoft Bing, and, uh, and Microsoft has said, you get to have your own private internet. Okay. So what does that mean then about the hardware network that you have? Well, you don't need it anymore. Right. And some of you are caught in between the process of having some of your work still on the old hardware network from the old technology, but being asked to now work in the new technology on SharePoint. And so you're caught in between and you have people that are afraid to move it forward and stuff like that, right? So you guys are in the middle of the transition and th these are the growing pains that you're probably experiencing, right? So I want you to know that migration is a big conversation when it comes to SharePoint because you cannot just copy the, the files from one hard drive to the next hard drive because SharePoint is not a hard drive, right? There's permission levels, there's all kinds of complications that you will have to understand and work through if you want to migrate from a hardware network to a SharePoint site. Now, should you migrate from a hardware network to SharePoint site? Absolutely. You absolutely need to do this process either sooner or later, but everybody's going to end up working from the cloud. This is the way technology is going. So I always tell you, learn to surf. Okay, because when you surf, you're going to surf yourself into the shore. But if you don't learn to surf, you're going to get washed up on the shore anyway, right? Probably choking and spewing water, right? So I don't want you to get washed up on the shore. I want you to surf in looking all nice and cool because you know your technology, all right? So realize that SharePoint is your company's private internet. If you've ever seen it on the internet, you can create it for yourself in SharePoint. Okay. So SharePoint is not an independent situation. So I want to show you that SharePoint is also connected to other things that you're going to have to be aware of. So first and foremost, um, if SharePoint is web pages, that means SharePoint is there for your content. Now let's use Amazon as an example. All right. 
Can you imagine, tell me, would you use Amazon if it worked like this? If your Amazon site was that you're gonna go and search for these four products, right? So you search Amazon for these four products and you find the first one and you click on it and it opens up a Word document and the Word document has all the details about the product, all right? Then you find the second product and you click it and it opens another Word document. Now you have uh, three and four and you have four Word documents open. These are the products you wanna buy. So now you're gonna add them to your cart. So you click cart and when you click cart, it opens an Excel spreadsheet. All right, and now you're gonna transfer all the information from the four Word documents into the Excel spreadsheet. And we love Excel so much because Excel is gonna calculate our taxes for us and our total price and everything. And now we know how much our items are gonna cost in this Excel spreadsheet. So now we're ready to hit purchase. So we hit purchase and when we hit purchase, it opens an Outlook email, a new Outlook email. And now I have to attach all the documents to a new Outlook email and put my card information in the email body and I'm gonna send it to shopping online at amazon.com send and I'm gonna send them an email with my order right and then of course I'm gonna get a, like a automatic out-of-office reply from your order has been received and you're gonna get that read receipt okay would you guys use Amazon if that's how it worked no way nobody would do that because all of those things that you need to do are being done directly on the web page you're searching the information it's displayed on the web page you're adding it to the cart the cart is on the web page it's calculating your total directly on the web page and then you're hitting send and it's sending it to amazon directly from the web page you don't even need office now some of you have a job where everything that you do involves you managing content but at no point do you ever create anything using word or excel or powerpoint or anything so if all of that content was just on the website you wouldn't even need to have microsoft office right because the only thing you would be managing is content and the content is on the website all right so that is what the future is the future is that our content belongs on a web page not in another file not in a pdf all of that stuff that is the old technology the new technology is we're putting content directly on the web page now will this remove the need for files no it won't you still need a file for your movies your movies are a file your pictures are a file any logos you have those are all files P pdfs of content where you don't own the content well you can't do anything about that so you got stuck with a pdf there so i'm not saying that you can't use files any longer i'm just saying that the the new technology that's here should eliminate up to 80 percent of all the files that you're currently using because the content no longer needs to be in a file it can now be directly on the web page just like every single website you've ever used okay um now having said that haven't you also though experienced being on a website and clicking the link like download manual and you click and it does actually give you a file directly from the website okay so i'm not saying that a website can't manage files it can all right but it should not be managing all 5,000 of your files. Why don't we dumb that down to about, you know, 100 files and let your website manage about 100 files and all the rest of the content just be right on the web page. But what happens when you do need a file from a website? Are you actually getting the file from the website? No, because websites can't have files, right? What are you actually clicking on? You're actually clicking a URL. The URL is on the web page and the URL is actually pointing to where the file is actually stored. So when you're on Amazon and you find a product and you download the product manual, the file, yes, the file was stored somewhere, but not on the website. The file was stored somewhere behind the scenes, right? So where are files in the new world? All right, because in the old world, all of your files were on your share drive and you all had to navigate to the folder inside of a folder inside of a folder to get to the file, right? But in the new world, where are all the files? The files are all being kept in OneDrive. Now you guys have been hearing the term OneDrive for many, many years, and maybe you're clear or not clear on what OneDrive actually is. So let me clarify OneDrive for you. Um, so if the content goes into SharePoint, 
any additional files you have left are being stored in OneDrive. Now, here's the thing. What exactly is OneDrive then? Okay, OneDrive actually is a file structure, just like your uh, file explorer, right? The difference between the old world file structure, like your shared drive, and the new world file structure is you don't know where it is. <laughs> your, the new world file structure is not available to you. And you know what? You don't care about that, right? When you're on Amazon and you click to download the manual, you click the, the URL and it gives you the file, right? Do you then say to yourself, well, wait a minute, I need to know what folder that Amazon had this file. I need to go to Amazon's file structure to figure out where in case I need this again. Do you ever care where it came from when you have a URL? No, the URL hands it directly to you. You don't have to care where it was, right? So in the new world, we don't care where a file is. But I'm telling you that the file is in the background in OneDrive. And I'm telling you that so that you can win Trivia Pursuit or something like that, right? It's information that you should know just from a nerd standpoint, right? But do you need to know that? No. Do you care about that? Absolutely not. You don't care because that OneDrive is hidden from you. You will never have to manage where things are any longer because where things are are in OneDrive and you don't have to manage that. Now, maybe one or two administrators do, but you don't, okay? Not any longer. The only thing you're managing is the content on the SharePoint site, and whenever you need a file, there'll be a URL directly on the SharePoint site that you can click, and it will give you your file so you don't have to care about where it is or what folder it's in or anything like that, right? So OneDrive is a hidden, online cloud storage location for your files and you do not care whatsoever that that's true okay you don't care so i'm going to test you on this i'm going to be like do you care and you're going to be like no i don't care okay so i do need to clarify one more thing about onedrive though because sometimes you are going through your computer and you're, you click on the apps menu, for example, and you will see OneDrive in your list, right? And you're like, okay, there's OneDrive. I thought Andre said it was hidden. It is hidden. When you put content in SharePoint, when you put files in SharePoint, it's going to a hidden location. You don't know where it is, right? But when you're working in your computer, whenever you actually see the words OneDrive, I want you to know that that does not uh, uh, connect to what I'm describing to you here. When you see the word OneDrive right there, that is connecting to your personal cloud storage. So Microsoft has given every SharePoint user their own personal cloud storage. And whenever you see the words OneDrive, that's pointing to your private uh, spot. Now, is your personal cloud storage connected to SharePoint? Nope, it's not. It's not connected to anything except you, okay? So when you put something in OneDrive, that is your personal place. Now, the reason that you should put it in OneDrive instead of your desktop, okay? I know in the old world, everything's on your desktop, right? But your desktop is your laptop that you're carrying around with you. If you don't have your laptop, you don't have those files. But when you put everything now in your OneDrive, it could be on your laptop, on your home computer, anywhere you are from your phone, you can access your files because they are in the cloud, okay? So whenever you see the word OneDrive, it's your OneDrive. Otherwise, just know for no reason other than just trivia, nerd trivia, that all of the files are in the OneDrive behind the scenes. So when somebody asks you where are the files, just tell them it's on the SharePoint library. It's fine. Nobody's going to care about it. I know that you technically know that behind the scenes it's in OneDrive. Because when you look at your SharePoint library, it's just hyperlinks, isn't it? Right? Because your SharePoint is a web page. So your SharePoint library is a web page with a bunch of hyperlinks on it that point to files. And where are the files? They're in OneDrive and you don't care about that, okay? Now, there's a third piece to this triangle that you need to understand. The third piece of this triangle is called Teams. So if SharePoint is for the content and OneDrive is for the actual files, then Teams is for the people. So let's talk about what Teams is for a second. 
Can you imagine in the old world when you're sitting at your desk and everybody's at their cubicle and now it's 10 o'clock and it's time for a meeting, some of you are going to get up from your cubicle and go into the conference room, right? Now, when you go into the conference room, you're in there because the meeting is on a topic and you are affiliated with that topic. So let's say it's a manager's meeting. Well, you happen to be a manager, so you're going to go into that conference room and everybody else that's in the conference room is also a manager. So we could say you guys are the manager team, right? Or maybe it's a wellness meeting. Maybe you are volunteering to participate in the wellness program at your company. So everybody that volunteers comes into the conference room and what you all have in common is that you are all interested in participating in wellness, all right? So first realize that a team is a grouping together of individuals based on something that they have in common, a, a common um, platform or something like that. All right, so um, uh, then what happens? You sit in the meeting and you turn before the meeting starts and you're chit-chatting with each other. So there's chat going on, right? There's chat going on while you're in the meeting. Then the meeting begins and there is somebody who is presenting. So they are presenting in the meeting and everybody is focused and listening to them. And then they may turn and start writing on the whiteboard. So there's a whiteboard that they can write on. They can do whiteboard work live, uh, drawing things for you to see. They may pass out actual documents in that conference. So there's files involved, files that you all have. Or maybe they will call somebody on the phone and bring in somebody else to, to participate in the meeting via the remote. Or maybe they'll turn on a projector and they'll show a movie on a screen. So all of these things could happen inside the conference room and realize that everything that you're experiencing there is only for you because you're a manager in the manager meeting or your wellness in the wellness meeting. Everybody else sits out at their desk are not getting this information. They're not getting the files. They're not seeing what's on the whiteboard. They're not hearing what's on the screen. So what is Teams? Teams is the digital equivalent of being in a virtual conference, all right? And the difference is, in real life, you guys adjourn the meeting and you all go back to your desk and the meeting is over. But in the today's day and age, your connection to your team remains continuous. So even when you're sitting at your desk, you can then be participating in um, team events across teams in that virtual conference room even though you guys have not technically planned a meeting or are coming together. So this is using all the new technology in the new world to keep that team connected and expose that team to things that only apply to the team and to no one else, right? So that's what Teams is. So here's an example. Let's say you have a team called onboarding, right? Well, what's cool is when I have an onboarding team, I could drop you into the onboarding team and now you have access to all of the information that's on, oops, is it this way? You have all the information that's on your onboarding SharePoint site. All right. So um, let's say you go 30 days and now you're done onboarding. And uh, so I'm going to take you out of the onboarding teams and I'm going to drop you into the production team. So now that you're in the production team, when you go to SharePoint to look at the onboarding, all of that information is now gone from you. You no longer have permission to see any of the onboarding stuff because I took you out of the onboarding team. You no longer have permissions granted to see the onboarding content. Now you're in the production team and now you have access and permission to see production content. And then I'm going to say, while you're in production, I'm also going to put you on a special project, right? So I'm going to put you on project X. So now, in addition to seeing a SharePoint site with all the production content, you also see a SharePoint site with all the project, project X's content as well, right? And in that SharePoint site, you'll also see links. And remember, the links are going to point you to all of the project X files that are in OneDrive, right? You see how I did that? Project X files, okay? Now, do we care about project X files? No, we don't. Because they're on OneDrive, we don't care about that. As long as we can go to the Project X SharePoint site and click the URLs, that's all we care about, okay? So just recognize that Teams controls the people and their permissions, and that is what connects them 
to the content that's available for you for SharePoint. Now, all of this that I'm laying out is completely different from everything that you've been taught from the Industrial Revolution because this is all new. And the struggle that everybody is having is those of you that are learning Teams and learning SharePoint for the first time are being told by those that don't know Teams and don't know SharePoint um, to replicate the same successful techniques that they had in the old world, but those successful techniques are no longer gonna work. For example, here's a good example of one of the successful techniques. You're working in a file, you're gonna share the file with everybody, so to be safe, you do save as and you put a copy on your computer, all right? So that way you always have a backup. That technique doesn't work any longer because now when you put a file into SharePoint, SharePoint makes that file the new file master. And when anybody collaborates with you to work in that file, everybody has access to work directly in the master. So there is no save as and there are no copies of the file floating around anywhere. All right. So that means when you have that hardware network, and we're moving that file to SharePoint, you have to take the file away from the hardware network because now the SharePoint copy of that file is the master copy. Now, what we love about SharePoint is SharePoint is keeping the version control for you. So once you start learning how SharePoint works, you're gonna see all the cool things that SharePoint does with all the latest technology. Now, there's one more thing that I wanna tell you about to wrap up uh, this talk, and that is that SharePoint does not produce anything for you okay so SharePoint doesn't make documents some of you think that when you're in SharePoint and you create a new document that SharePoint's doing that no what SharePoint does for you is SharePoint manages your content however some of you have the habit of going to SharePoint and then asking SharePoint to open a document for you so you go to SharePoint and you say can you open this word document so I can put my content in SharePoint is going to say, well, wait a minute, I'm in charge of content. Why are you going to open a Word document? And you're like, because that's what I'm used to. I know how to use a Word document. So SharePoint's like, but I got bells and whistles for you. If you just put my content directly on a SharePoint page instead of a Word document, I have all these amazing things for you. And you're like, nope, I'm going to keep doing it the way I've been doing it for the last 25 years. Okay. So you then open a Word document and SharePoint says, okay. I can help you manage the document, but now I, I can't do anything for you about the content that you put in that file. So once you have SharePoint managing your files, you can't use any of the tools that SharePoint has to manage your content. You're forced to use the authoring program. You're forced to manage your content in Word, or you're forced to manage it in Excel or in PowerPoint, because the content itself is in a container called a file and it doesn't have to be any longer. You can put the content itself directly into SharePoint and bypass the need for a file. So SharePoint does not make files for you, all right? Um, what it does is it takes your content and it allows you to collaborate with your content. So if you have list content that you would put in an Excel file, I'm saying don't put it in an Excel file, just put the content directly into SharePoint. SharePoint can manage your lists. If you have free, free flowing text that you would typically put in a Word document, don't put it in a Word document. Put it in a SharePoint page and then everybody can collaborate directly on the page in SharePoint and we don't need Word, all right? Now, we do have that 10 to 20% of files that we have to maintain. Our logos, our team pictures, all the, the events and all that stuff, videos, all that stuff, we still have to manage it. So that is why SharePoint still provides file libraries for you to manage it. But we just want to have less in them, right? We don't want to have 500,000 files in SharePoint. We want to have less files in SharePoint because SharePoint doesn't want your files. SharePoint wants your content. Okay, and then there's also some other cool things that you can do in SharePoint with forums and things that you'll discover once you start doing your SharePoint training. So realize that if you're not collaborating, you don't need SharePoint. If you're not collaborating, you're going to put it in OneDrive because that's your personal place. But if you are collaborating, 
you're not going to put it in OneDrive and then share it with everybody. No, instead, you're going to put it in SharePoint, which is, in a which is a collaboration environment. And if you're utilizing Teams fully, you could actually just put the information right in the proper team um, for the right group, and it will connect them to SharePoint automatically, and it will connect the right people to that content, and the whole thing starts to run streamlined. So. With that said, I'm going to wrap it up. This was an hour talk, so to speak. And uh, I am your instructor, Andre. I hope you got a lot of value out of just seeing uh, SharePoint from a different perspective. And uh, this is literally my very first video um, on my new uh, YouTube channel. Let's be thought. Um, yeah, let's be thought, right? Let's think this through, right? So uh, let's be thought. Please, please subscribe. Even if it's like just a mercy subscription for my first video, you can be like, oh, that's so cute. And just subscribe and ring the bell, right? I will be putting up more content and I want to give a special shout out to all of my students that come and, and take classes with me at ISYNC um, uh, where I teach courses um, quite often. Um, thank you guys because you guys and all of your feedback and all of you encouraging me to take some of these thoughts and make it available for you guys on YouTube. So thank you guys for helping me have the courage to create my first YouTube channel. And uh, I will see you guys soon in the next video.